Let's pray. Father, we thank you, as always, for just another opportunity to come and approach your word and hear from you and just to to set our lives in um, direct relation with the gospel. We come knowing that we are weak and frail, we are needy, we are broken, we are sinners. And yet we come knowing that when we open your word, we get to look at the story of redemption. We get to see how you loved us enough to send your son to take on flesh for the explicit purpose of living the perfect life and dying the the unnecessary death for us so that we can sit here today having hope that in spite of us being broken sinners, we can look forward to eternity in heaven with you. Father, I pray now as as we approach your word and and the gospel of John that you'd be with me and my words and you'd be with all of us, that you would open our hearts and minds to the truth of the gospel. In your name, amen. Well, I I would invite you to turn to the gospel of John. We're going to be, again, continuing in the study, picking up in verse 4 of chapter 1. 48 years ago, Disney World opened its gates And Disney World began to make their magical movies come to life. It would seem that no childhood is complete until they visit the happiest place on earth. Though the funny thing about that is, is that every time a parent comes back from there, they do not describe happiness. They describe, it was hot, and we walked a long ways, and we waited in lines, and we did all all these things and paid a ton of money, but they say it's the happiest place on earth. Now, I, I, my childhood was complete in this way. I did go to Disneyland and Disney World. And they say that it's a place that you are transported to a place where elephants can fly, puppets be, can become real boys, and fairy tale characters are your neighbors. But the magic of Disney World and Disneyland doesn't just stop with what you can see. It also includes what you don't perceive, what you don't see, what you don't recognize. You see, Disneyland and World, the company, has done a lot of research to figure out how they can hide things in plain sight. You see, there's parts of the park that you, you know, would take away from the happy, uh, the, the happiest place on earth, like lampstands at times and speaker holders and, um, and the backsides of other exhibits. And so they've created this thing that they call Go Away Green, that they paint various objects all over the park. And it works because when you go there, you never come back and go, you know, there were a ton of speaker stands all over the place that they would just make announcements on. Or you walk in, you think this place is huge, you're not realizing you're in one exhibit and actually the backside of the other exhibit is right there, but it just blends into the background. They have figured out how they, how, how they can trick our minds into not recognizing certain things. What makes the park the happiest place on earth is that they figured out how to get us to recognize the important things, to recognize the flashy things, to recognize the rides, and to ignore those less important realities. Today, when we jump into John, what we're going to see is that John is passionate about us recognizing the right thing, recognizing the most important thing. Think back to last week as we opened up this book and looked at the background. We started with the prologue. We're still in the prologue. The prologue of John takes place from John 1 to John 18. And what the prologue does is it summarizes how the Word of God, the Son of God, was from the very beginning and came into the sphere of time and history and in our tangible presence and how the Son of Man was sent to the world to become the Jesus of history. It describes for us what Jesus did in a very succinct and, and, and small package between 1 to 18. And the rest of the book does nothing more than explain what 1 to 18 does. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at verses 4 to 13 today. And then we're going to finish off the prologue next week. But over these, over these first three weeks, we really get to have a highlight of why did Jesus come. And what we're going to see today is that Jesus came so that we can recognize who the Son of God is. We saw last week as we looked at the first three verses that John wants to make sure that we know that his friend 
Jesus, the man that he walked with for three and a half years with on earth, the man that, that he had the privilege of calling friend, was no ordinary man. He was the son of God. The man who was from the very beginning, as we looked at, who, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was continuing, where the, the son of God Christ, the second member of the Trinity, was always in existence even before our beginning. That he had relationship with the Father and that he had created all things. Well, now today, as we're going to get to look at 1, 4 to 13, we're going to see that John, in this gospel, wants us to recognize Jesus for whom he is. I want to read for for us our passage today and then we'll, we'll jump into it. I'm actually just going to start from the beginning because there are, you know, three verses. It's, it's always good to reread things, set it in context. But we're going to start in verse 4 for our day today. But it says this in one one: In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. All things were made through Him and without Him. Was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him... Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, I want to start by looking at verse 4. And I want to start by talking about the word life. In him was life. John loves this word life. We're going to encounter this word 36 times throughout this gospel. And just to set that into context with the rest of the New Testament, that he uses it the most of any other New Testament book. The the next one in line is Revelation, and and John uses it 17 times there. A quarter, over a quarter of the times that this word life is used, it's used in the Gospel of John. So what is this life referring to? In him was life. If you set this in context of Genesis, because obviously when John is is using this language of in the beginning was the word, he wants us to transfer our minds back to the beginning of our world. I think he has Genesis 1 in mind as he's writing this beginning because he wants us to recognize that Jesus, our Messiah, did not come on the scene in year AD 1 at this point. He has always been. So when it says in him was life, In one aspect, he's saying in him was the physical life of the world. Because if we look back at Genesis 1, when God breathes out and, and, you know, speaks life into existence, he created us. He created all, all things as we have looked at. But the life that he's looking at here, I think it's more than just physical life. I think it's spiritual life. Here's the interesting thing, though, that happens in the Gospel of John. There's an assumption that John has. There's even an assumption that Jesus has. The assumption is of our spiritual death. Jesus never has to talk about the fact that we are dead. I mean, think about all the passages that we go to describe the the, um, sinfulness of man, the depravity of man. Paul wrote most of them. Paul was the guy who's saying, let me, listen, if you think that you are not as bad as you think you are, if you think that you are not dead, he's the one who's going to say, uh, no, you, they're, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jesus, and even John here, assumes the spiritual death that, that we are all under. There's no theological discussion about the darkness or death or the depravity of mankind. That's just assumed. So when he says, in him was life, And the life was the light of men. He is describing this fact of man is missing something here. When Jesus came into the world, he brought something that we needed. So what is this light of men? It's interesting that the light of men is something that even non-Christians talk about. It's not something that's just a Christian language. Regardless of your religion, there's a type of language that talks about a a healthy person has this light inside of them. 
When a person who's struggling with depression, anxiety, struggling in some way, they say, the light has gone out of me or it's growing dim. I think of uh, uh, one um, uh, person says this. This is Albert Schweitzer. As he's describing this light, he's not a Christian, by the way. At times, our own light goes out. So he's saying at times we grow dim. At times, he's acknowledging the fact that we're not as we're supposed to be. And he continues, and is rekindled by the spark of another person. Now, at times that does happen on a human level. In each of us, this is Schweitzer still, his quote, each of us has cause to think of the deep gratitude for those who have lightened the flame within us. There's this idea in life that we, that we walk around with knowing that when we are struggling, when we are hurting, when we are in need, that something needs to ignite inside of us so that we can get back to a better position, so that we can get back to a healthy position, so that we can no longer struggle with whatever we are struggling with. John and Jesus is, is really pointing to that struggle here. In him was life, is really describing that the thing that we need, the light has gone out in all of us. We are all dead in our trespasses and sins. We are all in darkness. And Jesus comes and is the light that we need. So what is this light and what is this life that he's describing? Well, what we're going to see, because as I said, the prologue is pointing to things in kind of big picture. And as we're going to see in this gospel, the life that he's talking about is having a relationship a connection, and access to the Father. When John says, in him was life, what he's saying is, in him we can finally get back to how it was supposed to be pre-fall. In him we can finally have a relationship with our Creator God. In him, we can finally have connection with Yahweh. In him, we can finally have access and we can enter into God's throne room with thanksgiving and praise and not stand at the door and shudder knowing that we are dead and broken and sinful and in darkness. In him, in the Son of God, in Christ, we can once again be connected to God. So in him was life and it was the light of men. When Adam and Eve sinned and mankind fell in the garden, we were not only thrust out of the garden of Eden, but the light of man went out. We were created as God's creatures to have connection with our creator. That it is not supposed to be the way that it is. Our world is not supposed to be this way where we are running amok and we are living in brokenness and we are living in sinfulness and in this darkness. That's not how it was supposed to be. And when Adam and Eve sinned and, that, and darkness came in and the light was gone, what we need was for that light to be restored. And what John is saying here is, listen, that light came to earth and he took on flesh But look how verse 5 continues with this discussion. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John says, the light has come. The person that we need has come. The solution has come. The person who, the ultimate person who's going to rekindle the spark inside of us, if I can quote Schweitzer again, the person who's going to uh, regenerate us and restore us has come. But now the question is, what's the darkness going to do with it? This verse here in verse 5, it's one of these verses that I think if you were to read the prologue, the first people reading the prologue, you know, just imagine the first people setting their eyes on this book. And, and you're reading it at verse 5, and you're like, I don't know what's coming. You, you may read verse 5 and go, what is he talking about? This is one of these verses that you'd look back on after you would go through the entire gospel and go, oh my goodness, I now understand it. But I'm going to describe this from our perspective. We, we know the end of the story. We know who Jesus is. We, we know the resurrection. So I'm going to assume some things here. But when it's talking about the light, when it's talking about this life that is found in Jesus, the life, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I need to talk about the last two words here, overcome it. In fact, your Bible may not have overcome it in it. Your Bible may have something different, and I'm probably going to like that translation better. I need to mess with some, some, some wording here. And, um, and if, if I may, while I am not a Greek scholar by any means, adjust the way that this word is translated. The word that I have in mind from, from the Greek is kata lambano. 
Catalambano. Now, if a Greek scholar shouldn't goes, that's not how you pronounce it, whatever. That's how I'm going to pronounce this word. And it can be translated to overtake or to overcome as it is in the ESV. But it can also be translated to recognize. To recognize. If you have an NIV, that's how they translate it. To recognize. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19 says this. So Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to kata lambano, to comprehend, to recognize all of the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that has surpassed knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. In Ephesians, this exact same word is translated to comprehend. The better way, I think, to to translate this verse, verse 5, is light shines in darkness and darkness does not recognize it. Now, the reason that I say that that's the better translation is because I think it carries the implicit narrative that's being described here. Jesus came to earth. There's no question about that. The Son of God took on flesh. The creator of the world took on the creation himself. Now the question is, what is the darkness going to do with it? And the real question is, are you going to recognize it? And that's why I say the the gospel of John and the rest of the prologue and the rest of the book really drills down onto this fact. Are you going to recognize who Christ is? Because the darkness didn't recognize it. And this translation, what, it, one of the ways that, that we can wrongly fall into kind of looking at, at the gospel is thinking, okay, Christ has, has come, and when we approach Christ, we approach it in a way of, well, you have to prove to me that you are good enough for me to place my faith in you. You have to prove to me that you are in fact God. You have to prove to me that you are trustworthy. Here, this description is not a God's on trial. This description is man is on trial. Are we going to recognize who he is? Are we going to recognize that he is the life? Are we going to recognize that we need him? So picking up on this idea of We have to recognize who Christ is. We can then ask the question, well, how are we going to recognize him? Verse 6. God didn't just drop Jesus into the world and say, well, I hope somebody stumbles upon him. No. There was a man sent from God as a witness whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. God knew that as sinners, we must, if our only hope, our, our, our only hope in life and death is to recognize the fact that Christ is the Son of God and He is our only hope. And when He sent Jesus to earth, He did not just send Him and plop Him down and say, well, I hope people recognize it on their own. He sent a messenger a witness to proclaim who Christ was. Now, think about it. God's always been sending messengers, though, to us, always been sending witnesses to us to make known his plan. The Old Testament is filled with messengers about who are constantly reminding us, proclaiming to us, somebody is going to come to make all things new. Some, some of the messengers were proclamations of thinking all the way back in Genesis 3.15 with the first gospel, the proto-evangelion, where there's this hope that, that Adam and Eve have. Somebody is coming to make all things new. And what we can see throughout the Old Testament in the story of redemption is that God is constantly reminding us of this fact. He's sending us witness after witness after witness describing trust in God. Somebody is coming. I mean, this is what Moses was. Moses came and he was a herald. He was, he was a, a prophet of God heralding to the nation of Israel. You can trust that God is going to save you. Somebody is coming. The interesting part is that God always uses light. Not God, uh, using light is a normal operating procedure for God to describe his witnesses. Just think about Moses going into the tent of meeting. What happened to Moses when he went into the tent of meeting? His face shone with radiance. 
so that the people couldn't even look at it. So he had to veil his, he had to veil his face so that he wouldn't freak out the Israelites. But what was he doing? This radiance that was glowing on his face was describing to the nation of Israel, I'm speaking on behalf of God. Think of the pillar of fire at night. This pillar of light that is there describing and proclaiming for the Israelites, God is here. Well, what does John do? John doesn't give some shadow. John doesn't say somebody is coming in the future. This witness, John the Baptist, when he comes in, he came as a witness to say, it's not the pillar of cloud or fire, and it's not the shining face. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This witness gets to come in and doesn't get the point to some future event. This witness gets to come in and goes, this is the guy. This is the light that we need. You need to recognize the fact that everything that has been proclaimed in the Old Testament, all of the shadows that we have been given are found in him. You need to recognize this fact. But there's two types of people in the Gospel of John. And there's two types of people in our world. Those who recognize Christ to be the Son of God. Those who recognize Christ to be the light. Those who recognize Christ to be our Savior. And those who don't. And unfortunately, there's no in-between. It's either do you see Christ and place your faith in Him and go, He's the one that we need? Or do you look at it and you're stuck in darkness and you don't recognize that fact? That's where John continues in verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Verse 10 kind of like rehashes what we've already seen in 1 to 3. He was in the world, but, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. I think some of that is John is just describing the, the audacity that the world has as our creator came. And we were blind to him. Our creator, the person that we were made in the image of came and we were blind to him. We are so stuck in darkness that when the architect came, we were like, you're not the architect. You're not that guy. Because we were stuck in darkness. He even came to his own. And what this means here when he came to his own is that he came to the people of Israel. He came to the nation that had been given all of the shadows in the Old Testament. He came to the people who should have been primed and ready to go to trust that Jesus was the Savior. He came to the people that saw the blood on the doorpost in the nation of Egypt. He came to the people that received the manna from heaven. He came to the people that that had the rock struck and it poured out water. He came to the people that had the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire. And I list all of those things because this people that he came to believed in that. They, They celebrate that. They saw that and went, that is of God. He came to those people and they did not recognize his own. And they did not receive him. They did not recognize him. But the all who did receive him. Because what we're going to see in the gospel of John as we get into it. Again, this is prologue. So this is all forward facing. We're going to get into all of these details as we jump into these stories. What we're going to see is that there's some people who come to Jesus and they just reject him and go, you're, no, you're not Jesus. Like people in his hometown. You're like, how in the world can you be the son of God? We saw you uh, grow up. We saw you um, mature. We saw your parents. We know where, you, where your home was, where your bedroom was. You can't be the son of God. And then there's going to be some people that immediately walk up and their faith is in him. And what's the description? Why, why does one person recognize him and one person not recognize him? And this is where, as Christians, we start to layer over these acts of moralism and acts of pietism and acts of piety onto the fact of why does one recognize Jesus and one does not? Well, John directs us towards those questions. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. But they became children of God not because of blood, like not because they were born into a certain family, Not because they were of the nation of Israel. Not because of some particular heritage that they had. Nor of the will of the flesh. 
In the sense of not, not because they tried really, really, really hard to finally recognize Jesus. Not because they, they um, applied themselves in some certain way. Not because of the will of man. Not because their parents so impressed upon them the fact that Jesus is life and Jesus is the light of men. Not because they sat under a certain uh, teaching and doctrine and dogma for so long that finally they were able to unscrew their darkness from them. No, but of God. It's, it's really, that's, that's actually a hard verse to read. That's a hard verse to comprehend. Because as a parent, I wish that I could apply my will to my children and, and dig down deep and make sure at all costs that they believe now and that they believe in the end. As a pastor, I wish that I could bear my will upon all of you. And if any of you are not believing and not trusting in him, that I could stand up here and I could just go on and on and on about the fact that Jesus is Lord and you need to trust in him. As a, as a man looking at this dark world, I wish I could get out there on a street corner with a bullhorn and just start screaming it to everyone. But here's what I have to recognize. The only person who can make somebody see it the only person who can make somebody hear it is God. That's why Jesus constantly walked around on this earth and said to him who has ears, let him hear. I mean, just think, again, this is not in John, this is in the other gospels, but consider all the parables that, that Jesus told. And even his disciples were like, what the, huh? What was that all about? And how did Jesus follow it? To him who has ears, let him hear. To him who recognizes that Jesus is Lord, he will believe in him and he will receive, become a child of God. It all comes down to recognizing him. Want to know what that means? Is that the, assur the assurance of our salvation is not based upon the stuff that we do. It's not based upon our blood. It's not based upon the will of our flesh. It's not based upon the will of any other man. It is based upon God. Understand here the limitations of recognizing Jesus. There's so much lacking in that. Here's what I mean. John calls us to recognize Jesus. He doesn't call us to fully understand Jesus. He doesn't say you can receive him as life when you even understand what he's doing on earth. When theologically you can describe all of the nuts and bolts of our salvation. When you see all of the, the ties back into the Old Testament. When you overcome some particular sin, when you change your life, when you make him Lord of your life, all, all of that things. He does not call us to that. He calls us to recognize Jesus. I mean, at the beginning of this, there's going to be people, obviously in Jesus' ministry, that walk up and place their faith in him by touching their cloak, by saying, Lord, you have the power to heal, by saying, Lord, I need to be with you. And this is even going to be pre-cross. They're not going to understand that Jesus has to go to the cross and die. They're not going to understand things like the act of obedience of Christ. They're not going to understand that the resurrection is a thing. They're not going to understand propitiation and adoption, all these theological words that we have here, which are great. They're going to understand the most basic things, but they understand the right thing. I need to place my faith in that object. I might not understand that object fully. I'm, that, that object might be uh, so... Um, you know, mind-blowing that I just have the, the, the basic understanding of theology, but it's, I'm going to trust in Jesus. If you're here today and you are struggling with your assurance because you feel that you don't understand enough, because you feel that you haven't studied enough, because you feel that you haven't changed enough, because you feel that whatever, you're not enough, the gospel that's already being proclaimed to us in the prologue of John is that it comes down to simply recognizing that we have to place our faith in him and he will receive us. Full stop. I want to apply this idea of recognizing um, just a bit further. For those of us who are in Christ, 
for those of us who by the grace of God have opened our eyes to the truth of the gospel and we see Christ as our Lord and Savior. One of the things that um, is a familiar church saying around here and, and, and a lot of other churches is that we need to have a big view of God. We need to understand the, 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 the fact that we are not God and, 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 and God is God. We need to, to have an understanding that God is in control of all things. We, we need not put God in a box, but understand that he is the creator of the world and, and is the creator, sustainer, and controller of all things and have a big view of God and understanding what he does. And this idea of recognizing Christ, and if I can couple this with the big view of God, is this. In our life, as we struggle through life, as we come to, to interact with, with more pain points, as things are thrown at us, as there's difficulties, as there's, as there's circumstances that we never dreamt that we would go through, each and every time it's an opportunity for us to recognize the power of Christ. Recognize that the person that we're placing our faith in was in the beginning and was with God and was God. And created the world. So often we can make Jesus just for our salvation, but not for our life. We can make Jesus that thing that we placed our faith in at that one point in our childhood or at, you know, at, a, at that point in our Christian life. But then we walk away from him. But a part of our Christian life is continually recognizing that we are with the Son of God. The creator of the world. That the person that we are placing our faith in is not just there for the beginning of our salvation, but is there for the entirety of our salvation. And so maybe the lesson that you need to hear, maybe in the gospel of John itself, or maybe just today, is recognize the fact that the person you're placing your faith in is in control of all things and has not left you and is still holding you. And you are still there child. A part of recognizing is acknowledging that the thing exists. That's really when it says, you know, when, when darkness did not recognize it, darkness just didn't see Jesus for whom, for who he was. He didn't see that the son of God came into this world. Acknowledging what the thing is. As we turn towards communion today, I think this is another great opportunity, opportunity to acknowledge the hope that we have in Christ. Acknowledge what these elements mean. Acknowledge what they're pointing towards. Acknowledge that I recognize that the Son of God came to take on flesh and we can trust in that. And so maybe today you, you're struggling with, I don't, I don't know what, with either how the world has gone awry, whether the particular life circumstance that you are dealing with that no one else knows about, whether a, a, a physical pain point, a spiritual pain point, an emotional pain point, I don't know what. But we can acknowledge that all that we need is found in Christ. And as we take these elements together this morning, I pray that you would be renewed in that fact, that you would once again recognize that what you need is found in Him. Let's pray and we can take this together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for sending your son. Lord, uh, the message of hearing that we can't will somebody into seeing Christ, we can't change anyone's heart, we can't force them to, out of darkness in, into the light can be difficult to hear. Because for so many of us, we have loved ones that we, we so dearly want to come to you. So, Lord, this morning, I, I, I pray for those individuals, those people that are on our hearts and our minds that we're grieving for. Lord, open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. Give them ears to hear. Give them eyes to see. Give them hearts to believe. Lord, do a miraculous work in them as you have in us by taking the heart of stone out and putting in a heart of flesh, by regenerating their souls, by, by calling them to yourself, by reconciling them to you. 
Father, I pray now as we take communion, for those of us who need to recognize you are still a part of our life, recognize your power, recognize what you have done, recognize that you are the Son of God who created all things. Lord, help us just sit in that hope that we have a relationship with you. In your name, amen.